Today's sermon is titled, Lust. So we are actually looking at the words and works of Jesus, uh, which we've been doing from, I think, January, from the beginning of the year. And we are still on this journey to see exactly uh, what Jesus meant and what it means to us today. I'm quickly going to do a recap of last week, uh, if you were not here last week. Uh, last week, we looked at Matthew 5, verse 21, up until verse 26. We saw that Jesus told the people in the sermon here, this whole account from Matthew 5 to 7 is called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus told the people that if you are angry with your brother, it is exactly the same as murder. So Jesus was telling the people that this is exactly the same Thing. And if you are angry at your brother, you should also deserve the penalty which you would get for murder as well. We saw that anger and murder are the same root of sin. They come from the same root. Obviously, murder is a lot worse than anger, but in a sense, it is the same uh, root. They come from the same sin. Uh, murder is the worst expression of this sin. So Jesus struck at the heart uh, of the people he was speaking to uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And the same with us today. Jesus struck in our hearts, telling us that when we are angry, it's the same as murder. Uh, we asked the question that, uh, is it exactly the same today? And what was the point that Jesus was trying to make. And what Jesus was trying to say was that uh, it all starts in the heart. Everything we do, everything we think about comes from inside. It comes from our heart. And I also just want to quickly mention the following. Uh, so last week's sermon, uh, we looked at anger or being angry. But in the context, uh, the passage we dealt with last week, uh, anger, we are not supposed to get angry at one another in church. And when we do, we should approach that brother or sister and speak with them in private. But there is sometimes times when we do get angry for the right reasons. Uh, that's a sermon for another time. Uh, as we have saw in the Gospels, Jesus got angry and what did he do? He made a whip of cords, uh, and he chased out all the people in the temple. So there is times uh, when we do get angry, but it needs to be for the right things. Uh, like I said, that's a sermon for another time, which we will get into. And if I look at the world today, I also get angry. I get angry when the Word of God is being done in injustice by people preaching from the Bible but they're not living the words they are preaching. Uh, I get angry when so-called pastors preach the false gospel to people, telling people uh, things that are not in the Bible. So yes, there is a place for righteous anger, but in the context of last week's sermon, the anger was being angry at one another. But we will look at anger, uh, another sermon on anger, uh, probably going to be in next month, just to clarify and clear up um, a few things. So, everything in this whole account from Matthew 5, 21 to 48 deals with the inside of Christians. And today's uh, passage comes from Matthew 5, verse 27. And I'll read, follow along if you will. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery of her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, thank you for 
for your word this morning, Heavenly Father. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will guard us and guide us this morning in this passage, that you will help us to understand what Jesus exactly meant with this. And if we are guilty of this, Lord Jesus, that you will come and convict us of this and that you will help us to to put these things down, Heavenly Father, that we will be a people that glorifies you, God, and and lifts your name up high, Heavenly Father, that we won't be uh, people, Heavenly Father, that bring dishonesty and dishonor to your name, God. We know that we, we still sin, Heavenly Father. What we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will sanctify us on, on this journey, that it will be a continuous thing in our life, a daily thing, and that you will help us uh, with this. Thank you, God, that you are good, and thank you that you will always be good. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we see that Jesus is saying, again, that you shall not commit adultery. Last week he said you shall not commit murder. Today he moves to adultery. And yet again, here Jesus said, you have heard that it was said. The same like last week in verse 21, Jesus also told the people that you have heard that it was said. So yet again, Jesus is taking the people back to things that they already know, the law that they already knew. He's reminding them of the law which was given to them by Moses. But also, they also made a lot of their own rules and laws as well, the scribes and the Pharisees. As a matter of fact, they had 613 laws to uphold. And if you failed in one of those, you basically failed in all of them. So this is what Jesus is trying to show them. Everything starts from the inside. So Jesus is saying, you have heard that it was said. Just like our passage last week, Jesus is putting adultery in the same category as lustful intent. He's putting them next to each other. And I think if we can quickly think about that, uh, to think about being lustful or committing adultery, we know that it's, in a sense, not the same. Because in adultery, you need to commit the act. But in the lustful intention, you think about it. In a sense, we can say, but it's actually not, it's not the same. But Jesus is telling us, I'm telling you that it is exactly the same. If you think about it or if you commit it, it's exactly the same. So firstly, we need to go and look. Was there a law against committing adultery in the Bible? Was there a law? And the text takes us to Exodus 20, verse 14. And it says the following, You shall not commit adultery. Just like that. Short and sweet, you shall not commit adultery. When you look in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you will see that the same with murder. If you committed adultery in, back then, you were supposed to get the death penalty. You were supposed to be killed for committing a crime uh, against God. We also saw that Jesus with the, the woman which they caught in adultery, when they brought her to Jesus, they picked up stones to throw her with the stones because that was the punishment for committing adultery. But we know in that account that Jesus started writing on the, on the ground. Probably, he probably wrote down their sins because he probably he knew their heart. That's probably why they threw the stones away and they left. Well, we never know exactly what he wrote on the ground, but it's something to think about. So we see that uh, committing adultery, you also need to deserve the death penalty. And, and we see here in Scripture as well, Jesus is saying that if we lust, we have already committed adultery, which is telling us that we should also deserve this punishment, this penalty. This is what Jesus is telling the people. So adultery was a serious offense, and it still is today, as it breaks the covenant of marriage. Uh, Malachi 2 verse 14, God said the following, But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been 
faithless. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. So God has, in God's original plan, He has put man and woman together to be in union, to be, to be one. We are not allowed to commit adultery. So we see here that marriage, also in the Old Testament, when we look at the nation of Israel and God, it was, they were in a covenant with each other. Uh, it was like Israel was married to God. God was their God. And they were his people. And God, how many times told them in the Old Testament that they have committed adultery? So even the nation of Israel, uh, how many times have they professed that God is their God? Have they turned away from God? So even in the Old Testament, marriage was uh, seen as the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And in Jeremiah 5 verse 7, God said, the following, how can I pardon you? Your children have forsaken me and have sworn by those who are no gods. When I fed them to the fool, they committed adultery and trooped to the houses of whores. They were well fed, lusty stallions, each neighing for his neighbor's wife. Shall I not punish them for these things, declares the Lord? And shall I not avenge myself? on a nation such as this. So even when we see marriage uh, in the Old Testament, it referred to Israel being in a covenant with God because they were God's people. But here we see how many times have they worshipped the golden calf or other gods before God, being disobedient to God. And what happened to them? God usually gave them over for other nations to rule in Israel or take them into captivity. And here we see today that Jesus is telling us that adultery and lustful intent, they are exactly the same things. So adultery, when we look at adultery, it is having intimate relations with someone that is not your husband or your wife. Uh, and I also need to say in this context, it's uh, speaking about the man looking lustful upon a woman, but it's the other way around as well. There's women that can also look lustful up to men. So adultery is having an intimate relations with someone that is not your husband or your wife. And it can happen, it can happen in both ways. Uh, so what are the consequences of adultery? I think before we get in here, let's quickly have a look. Let's look at a man uh, who was close to God, very, very close. God even called him a man close to his heart. And that man is none other than King David. So King David, uh, when you read the accounts of King David, King David actually had eight wives. He not only had one, but he actually had eight wives, not even to speak about his son, Solomon, that came after him, that had hundreds and hundreds of wives. So I don't know how he managed to have hundreds and hundreds of wives. I think one is enough <laughs> for a lifetime, and I say that in a good sense. God uh, intended us to have uh, one. I will never make it with four or five wives. One wife is enough for me. I'm very glad to have one wife, and I thank the Lord for that. So let's quickly look at, at King David. What happened with King David when he committed adultery? And this account takes us back all the way to 2 Samuel 11, verse 2. And this passage is going to show us exactly where lustful intent comes from. Before we commit the act, Something happens just before that. And here we see it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. 
that he saw from a roof, from the roof, a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. In a sense, David, first of all, David was not where he was supposed to be. David was supposed to be on the battlefield with his soldiers. He was supposed to be in war, not relaxing on the couch, sitting at home, sleeping days away. He was supposed to be fighting the battle with his soldier. So first of all, David was not where he was supposed to be. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So we see the act of David committing uh, adultery. There's consequences. There is a baby on the way. So David has a child on the way. So first of all, David should have not been, like we've said, on the rooftop. He should have not been there. And what's interesting about this account, it says, when you look at this uh, in the context, David, uh, let me just have a look, he looks at the woman. So it says he, he didn't look once. He was actually, probably it happened before. He probably saw her maybe a few times before because he's walking on the roof. So back then, the king's palace was very high. So he could see out on all the other houses in Israel. So actually, David was actually looking and looking and looking and staring at Bathsheba. This wasn't the one time, oh, I saw she was beautiful and then uh, let the messengers go and get her. No, David actually looked at her uh, for a while. So here we see David latched his eyes upon her. And here it gives us uh, the how can I say this, the evidence of where this comes from. It all started in David's heart because he was looking at Bathsheba. So the more he looked, the more he started to think about Bathsheba being in bathing outside. So the seed was already in his heart. It was already inside. And it just grew and grew. So yet again, here we see that Adultery starts in the heart. This is why Jesus is saying, when you look lustfully upon a man or a woman, you have already committed adultery. So it all starts in the heart. So yet David, start, it all starts with David in his heart. So David saw, he inquired, and then he yielded to temptation. He saw he went to find out who she is, and then he gave in to temptation. So David's adultery and murder had severe consequences. David was actually supposed to receive the death penalty, even though he was the king, because that was the law. If you commit adultery, you were supposed to receive the death penalty. So David was actually supposed to receive the death penalty for his crimes. And then in 2 Samuel 12, verse 9, when God sent the prophet Nathan to David, this is what happened. Look at the consequences of David's adultery. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah, the Hittite, with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And if you go and read uh, the accounts of David after this, go look at David's children, how they tried to kill him. Go look at the nation of Israel. They were torn in two uh, with the reign of Solomon, and it all started with. King David. So Israel was divided because of the sin of 
David. And in this, even in this, God was still gracious to David because he didn't receive the death penalty. He had consequences for his actions. Uh, but God was still gracious in this. Sin is never right in the eyes of God. We will always face the consequences. I, I challenge you to go and read uh, the accounts of David, to go and see what happened, how his own sons tried to kill him, Absalom and the other sons of him, how they, the sword never departed from David's house. And because of David's sin, the child died, and eventually the nation of Israel was divided in two because of one man's sin. So adultery has serious consequences. So we've seen from this account from David that adultery is very bad. And even though God does forgive our sins, we will always face the consequences. We will always face the consequences of our sin. So yet again, Jesus is raising the bar very high here, saying that adultery and lustful intent are the same things. The passage is very similar to the one we had last week in Matthew 25, 21 to 26. So once again, Jesus is making an illustration, putting two things next to each other. We should always remember that adultery destroys marriages and ruins families. It is the most destructive expression of lust. And lust is a seed that can blossom into adultery when it's full grown. These are two sins in the same category. Here we have another two sins. They are in the same category. It all starts with lust. And then eventually it grows and grows and grows until you have adultery. This is what Jesus is telling the people. Here. Everything we do comes from our heart. Uh, let me ask you the following this morning. What are the eyes uh, of your, what are the windows of your heart? What are the windows of your heart? It is your eyes. That which you see, which you look upon, which you take in, goes into your heart. And this is exactly what happened with King David. So but Jesus is saying that they, it's the same sins. They are in the same category. They have the same root. So both deserve punishment. But how can this be possible? If I'm only thinking about it, how can Jesus say that I need to cut off my right hand or throw away my right eye? What is Jesus telling us here this morning? So, first of all, verse 28, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So lust, the word lust, when we look at the original meaning of the word, it basically means it's a desire or long for something. And lust is not always just uh, for adultery. You can lust many other things in life. You can lust for a big house, uh, a big car. But in this context here, it is referring to adultery. So there's many things that we can lust after, but in this context, Jesus was speaking about adultery. So it's a long or a desire for something that you really, really, really want. You may you desire that really, really bad. So looks, in, in this passage, the word looks, in the passage speaks and refer to the constant and endless process of looking. So it's not just, oh, I just gazed my eyes, something came on, uh, in my vision and I look away. No, this means gazing, looking, uh, going out to, to look and not stop looking. So this is what Jesus is saying. Yes, there will be times when things get into our vision. If you look today in the world, if you see how some people dress today, you'd be very shocked. Some things come before our eyes, but this is not what Jesus is saying. Uh, Jesus is saying with this word looks, it is someone that goes out and I look and look and look. I go out to look. I go out to lust. I 
This is what Jesus is saying. This is not referring to accidentally seeing something and then looking away because it does happen. We see how people dress in today's world, especially when the summertime uh, arrives. So Jesus is saying here, Jesus is therefore speaking of intentional looking with the purpose of lusting. This is what Jesus is saying. If your intent is to go out and look and lust, uh, it's the same as committing adultery. This is what Jesus is saying. He is speaking of the man who looks so that he may satisfy his evil desire. This is, what, this is the point that Jesus is making. He is going out uh, satisfying your desire of looking, 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 and lasting. This is what Jesus is saying. And John MacArthur said the following about this, and I quote, It is not lustful looking that causes the sin in the heart, but the sin in the heart that causes the lustful looking. The lustful looking is but the expression of a heart that is already immoral and adulterous. The heart is the soil where the seeds of sin are embedded and begin to grow. So yet again, parable of the sower, uh, where the guy went out to sow, uh, the farmer went out to sow the seeds. It's the same with us today. What do we see, what do we sow in our hearts? Uh, what are we busy with daily? What do we take in? What do we allow to grow inside our heart? If I'm going to watch Netflix for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're probably going to know what's going to grow inside my heart. It's not going to be very good. Uh, it's all, what he's saying is all, everything starts in the heart. Um, this is why these men and women went out to look lustfully because they already had adulterers and an immoral heart because the soil is rotten. The soil is wrong. So this is what Jesus is saying. Jesus' point was simple. The Pharisees was always concerned with the external things. Like I said last week, oh, look at me. Look how I stand and pray on the street. Look, oh, I give people food. Oh, look, I go to church uh, nine times a day. I pray 20 times a week but never looking at the things inside. This is the point that Jesus was making. Because the Pharisees and the scribes and the people were always focused on, but I didn't commit murder, I didn't commit adultery, but inside they were angry and lusting. So this is the point that Jesus is making. He's saying, but you guys are actually already guilty of this because it comes from the inside. The Pharisees, the people, the scribes, they never focused on the condition of the heart. Sins like anger and lust. And it's not sins that you can always see. This is why Jesus is speaking directly to them. This is why people are actually in awe here with Jesus telling them that these things are the same. Because you can't always see someone is lusting or someone is angry They've got anger in their heart because they, you will ask them, how are you today? And they will say, oh, no, I'm very good. And they'll give you a smile. <laughs> it happens, people. It happens, church. We can't see these sins. This is why Jesus is addressing these sins. And this is the thing. Jesus wanted to correct the emphasis on the externals. He wanted to show them, but it's not all about the outside. It starts inside. Everything starts with our heart. What is going in on inside our heart? God is concerned with our actions and our attitudes. But first of all, God is more concerned with what goes on inside. Because if the soil is good inside, my actions will back up what I believe inside my heart. And this was the opposite for the scribes and the Pharisees. God looks at the heart. If we keep all, this is what Jesus was saying, if they were keeping all the external laws, the 613 laws that I had, but they were lusting or were angry, they have failed in all of them. This is what Jesus was telling them. Uh, you, may, you maybe did not 
do these acts physically, but inside you've already committed them. So you're actually already uh, guilty of those sins. So this is what Jesus was trying to tell them. So what is the solution to a lustful heart? What is Jesus saying? If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members, that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than the whole of your body go into hell. So I have brought a big axe this morning. I've got an axe there at the back. If you struggle with one of these, I want you to come and bring me your right hand and your right eye so I can cut it off and take your eye out. Is there anyone that will stand in the line for that? Surely no. There's no way. So what was Jesus saying here with cutting off the right hand and tearing out the right eye? Because if Jesus was saying we should do this physically, I believe all Christians today would not have a right hand or a right eye, to be quite honest with you. All of us will have a left hand and a left eye. So why the right hand and the right eye? Because in the Jewish culture, uh, the right side of the body was referred to the best side of the body. So your right hand, you possess the better skills than the left hand, and your vision, your right vision, uh, was better than your left eye's vision. So this is why Jesus is telling them, all right, what do we need to do? Uh, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better that you lose one of your members than that of your whole body be thrown into hell. So why is Jesus saying we should cut off our hand and tear out our eyes this morning? Was this what Jesus was saying to him? Because I think if we should cut off our right hand or our right eye, our left hand and our left eye will then all the more work a lot more harder to lust or to commit these sins because these parts won't be here. So these ones need to fulfill the job of the other one. So what was Jesus actually saying here? So Jesus was actually saying that he was making, we call this hyperbole, hyperbole. He was making an over statement about something, about the right eye and the right hand. So Jesus was saying the following. Jesus is saying here that we should be willing to give up whatever is necessary, even the most cherished things we possess, if doing that will help us protect us from evil and sin. So this is what Jesus is saying. We should remove all these things from our lives that causes us to stumble, that causes us to sin, that causes us to lust. This is what Jesus was telling them. Nothing is so valuable as to be worth persevering at the expense of righteousness. So Jesus is saying you need to remove anything and everything in your life which causes you to last and sin. This is what Jesus is saying. So, how do we, how do, we uh, do this today as Christians today? How do we apply this to our lives? Because it was the same for these people and it's the same for us today. So, I'm just going to give a few, a few examples. If the television uh, or laptop makes you to last, uh, switch it off and get out. Practical, practical solution. Switch it off and get out. Go for a walk. Switch off the TV. Uh, cancel Netflix. <laughs> cancel your internet. You need to take practical steps as well. Uh, God working with us in sanctification. If social media makes you to lust or sin, delete the apps. Delete all those apps that you get today. Instagram, Facebook, I don't know what other apps you have out there. But if it does, what is Jesus saying? Remove those things if they cause you to lust or sin. We need to take all the necessary steps to put the members of the flesh down and please and honor God. And yes, will, you, will we still stumble from time to time? Yes, 
But like I've said previously, what's the direction we're going in? Uh, are, we, are we moving in a direction of change or are we falling back into those things? So Jesus is saying here to the people and to us today to remove all things that makes us to lust. This is what Jesus is saying today. So how, how do we do it? I'm going to give you two verses this morning. And the first verse is Job 31 uh, verse 1. So we've said that uh, our eyes are the windows of our heart. So what we see is what we let in. So the first one will be Job 31 verse 1. And this is what Job did. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? This is what Job did. So basically what he did, and it's for us today as well, only look unto things that will glorify God. If there's certain movies or certain programs that you know you shouldn't watch, switch it off, get out of there, go for a walk, switch it off. Uh, this is what Job did. He made a covenant with his eyes saying, I would only look upon things that are holy to God. I will not look upon any other things. And the other one is Colossians 3 uh, verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. And the word put to death here, in the Greek, it means mortify. So it's basically saying you need to make a corpse. The members of your body that makes you sin, you need to make a corpse of them. You should not use them to uh, commit these sins. And it's like I've said, take all the necessary steps to not make our members of our body workers of the flesh, which we once were in and which we did. We have died with Christ and therefore cannot make our members workers of iniquity. And this is a... Uh, how can I say, this is an active role on our side and God's side. We work hand in hand with God uh, with these matters, especially lustful intent. Uh, I believe that when we make the decision to not look upon things that are unholy uh, or dishonoring God, He will honor us in that decision and He will help us to look upon things and do things that glorifies Him. And this is what Jesus was saying. Jesus did not mean that these words literally. Lust does not live in the eye or in the hand. It does not live, lust does not live in our hand or in our eye. Cutting off your hand will not cure lust in your heart. There is no way that that would be a, remed a remedy for that. Jesus' point was that we must deal radically and ruthlessly with the sources of all temptations in our lives. And this is what Jesus was telling the people here. Everything starts from, it all starts from the inside church. What's going on inside of our hearts? What are we thinking about? What are we looking, um, what are we listening to? What do we allow in to... Um, to change our outlook on the world or what influences us. It's all these things. And Jesus is saying everything starts from the inside. Uh, and when we do fail, it is not fatal. It is not the end. God says in 1 John 1, 9, that all who have sinned can go to Him and ask for forgiveness. And He will cleanse us from those sins and He will wash us clean. Jesus died even for the sins that we will still commit. Uh, but we need to, we're playing an active role uh, with God and the Holy Spirit to put down our members uh, so that we can honor God and do everything that pleases Him and honors Him. Uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we come this morning before you and to be honest, quite quite hard words this morning, Lord Jesus, but truthful, because you, you are the truth, Lord Jesus, and you are the word. Uh, we come this morning to you, Lord, uh, as a congregation, Heavenly Father, and we ask you that you will help us, Lord, with 
with these battles, Heavenly Father, with sin in our lives, Lord, with temptation in our lives, Heavenly Father, that we will make a choice, Lord, to put those things down, Heavenly Father, and look unto You, and look unto Your Son and the Holy Spirit. You have given us Your Word, Heavenly Father, to, to fight these battles, Heavenly Father. And also You have given us Your Holy Spirit as well, God, to lead us and guide us in these things. God, my prayer this morning is, Lord, that You will help us, that we will be a people that honor You, Lord, that what we say we will do, Heavenly Father, and that our hearts will be pure uh, unto You, Heavenly Father, that You will look unto us, Lord, and when You see us, that You will see Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that You will forgive us, Heavenly Father, for when we do fail, Lord, and when we stumble, God. But I believe, God, that You are the shadow on our right hand. You are the one that leads us, guards us, and helps us, Heavenly Father, even with these things in our life, God. Thank you that you...